you see it on the sign. Good morning, everyone. Would you all please take a seat? I'd like you to give a round of applause to Robert Cunningham of the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office with the pipes and drums. Thank you. <laughs> Veterans, honored guests, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Betsy Lamacchia. I am a member of the Board of Trustees of the Library. And on behalf of the board, I am very pleased to welcome all of you to the library's 60th annual Veterans Day commemoration. We are here this morning to pay special tribute to our veterans and to honor all the members of the armed forces who have served our country both in wartime and also in peacetime and who continue to protect us while serving in the military today. Thank you for joining us. And now, would you like to stand again for the Live Oaks J-R-O-T-C, presenting the colors. Would you please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And would you please remain standing while the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra Brass Trio plays the national anthem. Permission granted. And now you all may be seated. And the Symphony Orchestra Brass Trio will now play Beautiful Land, an arrangement of American patriotic songs.
Thank you. That was terrific. At this time, I'd like to introduce the other trustees and our special guests. And please stand as you're introduced. Our library trustees, Robert Hendon. <laughs> William Moran. Paul Sittenfeld, who's down there. Barbara Troth. And I'd also like to introduce Kim Fender, the Eva Jane Moran Romaine Coom, director. And my special thanks, or all of our special thanks, to the Friends of the Public Library and the Library Programs Fund for their outstanding support, not only of this program, but also for all of the others that they make possible throughout the year. And representing the Friends group is the group, Friends President Jay DeWitt. Thank you. Our purpose today is to honor our veterans who have protected our freedoms by their duty, their courage, and their selfless service. They are the real VIPs. I happen to be an Army brat, so I know what goes through with it. Would all those who are currently serving on active duty please stand? Are all of you here? Okay, go on. What? Would all the veterans who served in World War II please stand? All of the veterans who served in the Korean War. Not one. And how about those who served in the Vietnam War? And are there any who served in Iraq and Afghanistan? Just the one. We thank you very much for all your service to our country. And as a special thanks for your service, the library has commissioned a commemorative challenge coin, which will be available to all the veterans in attendance after the program. They can be picked up at the table in the back there. And now the Symphony Orchestra's Brass Trio will play the Armed Forces Salute, and we ask you if you stand when you recognize your service song.
as you all probably know, Veterans Day is a very special for us connected to the library. When the main library opened in 1955, it was dedicated as a war memorial to honor the servicemen and women from Hamilton County who gave their lives for the country. And the names of the 3,000 veterans who died while defending our freedom from World War I to the present are included in the two volumes of the Book of Homage, which are on display in the Veterans Memorial. And facsimiles of this book can be available to anyone who would like a copy after today's program, also at the back. Um, also, during your visit today, we'd like you to take time to visit three special exhibits that focus on the military and local veterans. The library is pleased to host Mail Call. This is a National Postal Museum exhibition organized and circulated by the Smithsonian Institute Traveling Exhibition Service. It's now in the midst of a 15-city national tour and tells a fascinating story of the military mail and communication from the American Revolution to the current wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Also, take time to look at the new exhibit in the Veterans Memorial showcasing military uniforms from World War II to the Gulf War. And we want to give a special thanks to Jeffrey Lienbrandt for his assistance with the display. And a third exhibit, Honors the Local War Heroes, is also on display in the Joseph S. Stern Jr. Cincinnati Room, which is on the third floor. It's called Serving with Honor, the Queen City Veterans, and it includes artifacts from the local veterans of the War of 1812 through the Gulf and Afghanistan Wars. And before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to mention the library's Veterans History Project, which is a partnership with the Library of Congress to collect the oral histories from American veterans. Everyone who has participated in the armed services has a story to tell that adds to our understanding of what the military service was like during wartime. The staff from the genealogy and the local history department will be in the atrium after the program to answer any questions that you might have about the Veterans History Project and sign up veterans for interviews if you would like to do that. Our keynote speaker today is Brad Winstrup, who is an Army Lieutenant Colonel, a physician, and a congressman. In 1998, seeing our nation attack time and again, he dialed 1-800. USA Army and joined the Army Reserve at the age of 39. He received a direct commission as a captain in the US Army Reserve Medical Service Corps. And in 2004, upon completion of officer's advanced course, he was promoted to the rank of major. He was called to duty in the spring of 2005, deployed with the US Army's 344th Combat Support Hospital Task Force to Abu Ghraib, Iraq, where he served as the podiatrist, the chief of surgery, and the director of wound care clinic. They obviously didn't have enough people to do each one. He also served as the assistant to the deputy commander, clinical services, which is equivalent to the chief of staff, and served as the acting DCCS for three months during his 12-month tour. In May of 2006, at the end of his combat tour in Iraq, he was awarded the Bronze Star, the Combat Action Badge, and numerous campaign medals. Upon returning home, Congressman Winstrup began to give speeches to civic organizations, talking about his time in Iraq and the duty to serve others. In 2012, he ran successfully for Congress, where he now represents the people of Ohio's 2nd Congressional District. In the 113th Congress, Congressman Winstrup served on two committees central to military life, the House Armed Services Committee, where he sits on the Tactical Air and Land and Military Personnel Committees, and the House Veterans Affairs Committee. In 2010, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and is currently assigned to the AMED Professional Management Command with attachment to the 4220 in New York. And during his time in Congress, he fulfills his reserve duties by serving at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Congressman Brad Wenstrup.
think you covered it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And believe me, it is my honor to be here with you today with so many veterans and families of veterans that sacrifice so much for all of us. Uh, this is not some place I ever really expected to be. When I was a little boy, I used to watch a couple of TV shows with my father. One was called Medical Center, and I knew at a young age that I wanted to become a doctor, and I pursued that. But there was another, another show that my dad and I used to watch that some of you will remember called Combat. And Combat was about a World War II heroes fighting Nazi Germany. And the idea of service never really left my mind. And throughout my life, as I was growing up, when I thought about our founders, I thought about those that fought, and I thought about those that thought. And I thought about those that did both, like George Washington. I thought about those that lead, that defend, that have, over the years, preserved our freedom for us, which has so often been threatened, as we know. And I always ask myself, who are these guys? Who are these people that step up and say, I will do this? So at 39 years old, I did join, and now I know who these people are. They're the 1%. Only 1% of Americans have worn the uniform throughout our history, and they've produced exceptional results. I can't think of 1% of any population that has achieved as much as our American military has done. From the beginning, 1776, ambitious Americans said there is a better way, and we will fight for that better way. And it was not so much for them as it was for future generations. And from that effort, from great minds, was launched a great idea that we, the people, will tell the government what it has the right to do, whereas in other countries, the government tells the people what they have the right to do. But our founders did task the government with one very major role, and that's to provide for the defense of our country in order to maintain our freedom. And this great gift of freedom has been preserved by our veterans for over 230 years. You know, the United States of America has often been called a great experiment. Well, out of every experiment, some hold card, cold hard facts are revealed. Freedom's not an experiment anymore. It's a time-tested, proven fact that freedom works. People thrive under freedom. Freedom is of great value. And like all things of value, it must be protected. And like all things of value, others want to steal it. So we have to defend our freedom. It's like an insurance policy, and the premiums have to be paid. And your American veterans have and are paying that premium for us. Remember to thank the ones that made it home and never forget the ones that did not. Because remembering, thanking, and caring for our veterans and paying tribute to them, there's more than just a nice thing to do. It's our obligation, our duty, as individuals and as a grateful nation. Only our veterans can truly take credit for the freedom that we enjoy. You know, the day after I returned from Iraq, I was out on a boat, no armor, wind in my face, and I never felt more free. And they say in more that we have ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I agree, especially from watching from afar, but after having been to the front, I can tell you that everything they're doing is anything but ordinary. The families of our troops are anything but ordinary. So I think we have extraordinary people doing extraordinary things and making them seem ordinary. And that includes the families who endure the sacrifice of those deployed all the time. Their sacrifices are great. They have all the same burdens that we have day to day and then some. Since 1776, over 42 million have served and over 1 million have given their lives. Millions more have been wounded. And I'm so blessed throughout my service to have, to have constant reminders of how great this nation is. But I also have some experiences that will never leave me, will never leave my mind, but do make me more grateful. When I was at Officer's Advanced Course, the Commandant of the Marines was speaking to us. And he was telling us about a time when he was in Vietnam and his platoon was pinned down. And it looked like they were all going to be killed when one of the Marines got up. And he ran along the beach to draw fire away from the platoon. And he ran along, riddled with bullets, and ran until he could run no more. But it gave the rest of his platoon the chance to get away. And then the Commandant of the Marines reminded us that this was in the 1960s. And that Marine was an African American. And there were places in his hometown where he couldn't get served a hamburger. Yet he did that for his fellow Marines 
and for his country. And that story reminds me that if you carry prejudice in your heart, you better take a look at who's defending your country today. Because in my own command, we had a first generation Korean, Filipino, Puerto Rican, two from Nigeria, Native American. We were black, white, brown, yellow, red. But we had one common purpose, one shared sense of mission. And all that mattered was that we were all Americans. Army chaplain, Father Tim Vakic, was hit by an IED in Mosul, Iraq. In May of 2004, he suffered severe head wounds from the explosion with shrapnel. He succumbed to his wounds in 2009. A couple years after his injury, I met someone from his unit. And he said, we ask Father Tim all the time, why are you going out with us? You can stay back on the base. You can be safer there. And you'll be there for us when we get back. But he kept insisting on going out with everyone. When he's asked about that, he said, I think the safest place for me to be is in the center of God's will. And if that's in the line of fire, then that's where I'll be. I want to tell you about Staff Sergeant James McNaughton, military policeman, New York City policeman, Army Reservist. He was stationed on our base, and one day he and two other sergeants were being tasked with a mission that was going to be dangerous, and one of them had to go. James McNaughton volunteered over the other two because the other two had children. On that mission, James McNaughton was killed by a sniper and killed. But today, there are two families that have their father because of James McNaughton. I had the chance to tell his story on national TV when I got home, and his father called me a couple days later, said, thank you for remembering and honoring my son like that. I think we don't do that enough today. And I'll never forget the time a Marine came in badly wounded, and we brought him right back to the operating room table, and I thought we were going to be able to save him. But I saw him slipping away, and I remember looking at the clock, thinking, I wonder what his family's doing right now. They have no idea what just happened to him. And when we lost him, the anesthesiologist looked up and said, he was at my table at breakfast this morning. That's how quickly things change. It was part of my job to tell Marines and soldiers when one of their friends was wounded what we were doing with them medically and taking them back to the operating room. And I can remember one time going into a room of Marines to tell them what was going on, that we were going to try to save their friend. I remember a Marine hunched over praying his rosary. And I'll never forget how I felt an hour later when I had to go back and tell him that he didn't make it. And I want to tell you about Major John Pryor, MD, a trauma surgeon from Philadelphia. John Pryor joined the Army Reserve in 2004, but on September 11, 2001, when he saw his country under attack, he said goodbye to his wife and three kids, and he got in his car, and he drove to ground zero and started taking care of people. And that experience never left him. And he thought about how in Philadelphia he was taking care of people shooting themselves up in the streets, and he thought, why shouldn't I be helping our troops? So we joined the reserves. We served together. We came home. We did a trauma conference together. In 2008, John went back to Iraq, and on Christmas Day in Mosul, he was hit by a mortar and killed after attending church service, leaving behind his wife and three children. What I think is even more amazing about John is not so much his selfless service, but what motivated him and what he portrayed to everyone. And it's exemplified by a quote he had by Albert Schweitzer above his desk that said, seek always to do something good somewhere. Every man has to seek in his own way to realize his true worth. You must give some time to your fellow man, even if it's a little thing. Do something for those who need help, something for which you get no pay, but the privilege of doing it. For remember, you don't live in a world all your own. Your brothers are here too. When I think of these great people, and there's so many more like them, I think of the words from the song America the Beautiful, who more than self thy country loved and mercy more than life. And to me, there's one thing more tragic than death, and that's the victory of evil. Arthur Ashe, great tennis player, hero to so many, as well-deserved, was once asked about heroism, and he said, true heroism is remarkable, he's sober, it's very undramatic. It's not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve others at whatever cost. This describes our veterans so well, serving others at whatever cost. And to me, every day is Veterans Day, because not one day has passed since the day I arrived in Iraq that I don't think about the war and think about our troops. 
and the national anthem is forever changed. When I hear rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air, I think of those we couldn't save. But when I hear, oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave, I think of those that have saved us time and time again. We enjoy great freedom, freedom to laugh, to live, to love, to enjoy watching our children play, to know that hey, they have unlimited potential in this world. We're free to enjoy family vacations, picnics, worshiping together, free to enjoy a ball game or a show. And freedom is the common thread that holds us all together. And freedom is the gift that our veterans have given us time and time again throughout our history. And throughout our history, so many of our veterans have just been one generation or less from immigration, immigration from lands less free than ours. I had the honor of taking three of our enlisted to Saddam Hussein's palace, the Afa Palace, and I watched them with about 100 other soldiers and Marines become new U.S. citizens, sworn in as U.S. citizens in Iraq while already serving their new nation. I think that together we make up the greatest nation in, in the history of the world. A people that live under one flag while arriving here from all corners of the earth. A gentleman named Mawafik al-Rabai, who's a member of the Iraqi Governing Council, he had something to say about who we are. He tells an interesting story concerning Saddam Hussein's trial. And he says, when we were asking Saddam Hussein difficult questions and throwing accusations, reminding him of his crimes, he was looking at U.S. Ambassador Paul Bremer and U.S. General Ricardo Sanchez as if he was asking the Americans to protect him. He felt safer with the Americans. When in captivity, Saddam Hussein did not look to his own countrymen for protection. He looked to us, Americans. Now, is that because we're evil? Or is it because we are decent, fair, and trustworthy? And it's ironic that a mass murderer named Saddam Hussein could see what so many don't see, that we're the good guys. And even upon his capture, Saddam was simply greeted politely with the words, regards from President Bush. We live in a strange world today. We have different enemies than we've had before, but our mission has always been the same. We subjugate no one, we have no empire, and our troops now and time and time again throughout our history have stood for freedom in places around the world until freedom could stand on its own two feet. In our own mission, we helped many. We saved the lives of friend and foe alike, adults and children through traumas and illnesses. There's a book called Faith of the American Soldier that talks about how our troops would get together and pray, not always in a formal service, but there was one passage in that book that really stuck with me. It was about a soldier who was at the Baghdad airport and he was getting ready to come home. And he began to cry and one of the other soldiers said, why are you crying? We're going home. And he said, because I don't think we'll ever be able to do as much for others as we did here. And I'm afraid life will seem mundane when I get home. Roberto Clemente, the Hall of Fame baseball player who died in a plane crash on his way to Nicaragua to help earthquake victims there, once said, if you have the chance to make life better for others and you fail to do so, you've wasted your time on earth. Our veterans have not wasted their time on earth. Those that serve are the best and brightest. They're successful and they're not without great prospect. They're not desperate, they're not derelict, they're not on death row, they just simply choose to put you ahead of themselves. And today we give credit where credit is due. It's Veterans Day and we willingly say thank you. Teddy Roosevelt said it so well when he said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and the sweat and the blood. Our veterans serve. They serve, they fight wars, wars they didn't start. And I believe that those who serve in war appreciate peace more than others. But for those who serve in war, it's a summons they don't necessarily seek, but it's a responsibility and a call that they don't shirk. And Southern Ohio has endured that as much as anywhere else in the country throughout our history and today. And while many have quietly come home to rest, their earthly mission complete, the quality of their character and the positive effects of their works will never perish. The question is, have we earned the freedom that we enjoy, that we enjoy because of the sacrifices of those that we honor and thank today? Would those that have died on your behalf be able to say that they're proud to have died for you? Are we maintaining an America that's a brotherhood and a sisterhood that's worth fighting and dying for? 
Do you have the appreciation for the sacrifices made? Think of the end of Saving Private Ryan, where the elderly, elderly Private Ryan is standing over the grave of Captain Miller, who saved his life, and he says, I hope that in your eyes I've earned what you have done for me. Ask yourself that question and try to feel that appreciation for our veterans, not only today, but every day. Our great American veterans, I think, can best be described in this way. They are what others care not to be. They go where others fear to go. And they do what others fail to do. And they ask nothing from those that give nothing. I want to thank you all for being here today. It's indeed my honor to be with you. To honor those that felt that they should give of themselves for something greater than themselves. I've been very blessed with the family that I was raised in. When I was a child, we'd kiss our parents goodnight and go to bed. My dad would come in one more time. He'd kiss us on the forehead. He'd take his thumb and he'd make the sign of the cross. When you tuck your children in at night or when you go to bed at night and you close your eyes and you feel safe and secure and unafraid, remember why that is. Thank you very much. That's a very sobering reminder of how privileged we all are and how lucky we are to be here. Um, each year, the Hamilton County veterans are remembered with wreaths presented by the various veteran organizations. Our first wreath will be presented for the Military Order of the Purple Heart, Chapter 3620, and it will be presented by Warrant Officer 1, Jeremiah Minor, and Mr. Ronald Marmon. Thank you. Our next wreath will be presented on behalf of the Greater Cincinnati Chapter of Tuskegee Airmen. It will be presented by Mr. James Shaw and Mrs. Carol Quackenbush. You can it? Okay. Ms. Mary Jane Perry will present a wreath for the American Legion Post 644, which is one of only six all women Legion posts in the United States and the only one in Ohio. You got it all? Thank you very much for being with us this morning and to be representative of your organizations. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we will have the Flame of Remembrance lit by Warrant Officer Jeremiah Minor. For over 230 years, brave fighting men and women have protected our freedoms with their duty, courage, and selfless service. The line of heroes continues unbroken today. And currently there are more than 1.4 million active personnel serving in the U.S. Armed Forces serving throughout the world. The legacy of our veterans continues to inspire our military to answer this call to duty. And as we've always said, we know that freedom isn't free and the eternal vigilance is the price we must pay for our liberty. And here to light the flame of remembrance is Warrant Officer 1, Jeremiah Minor. He spent a year in Afghanistan and two years in Iraq, spanned over several deployments. He is the recipient of several deployment medals, including the Army Commendation Medal, Air Medal, and the Purple Heart for wounds received in battle. He is currently serving and stationed with a small Army unit located on the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Thank you very much. All right, you can like. 
We are gathered here today to celebrate Veterans Day. Veterans Day is often confused with Memorial Day, where we honor our fallen in defense of this country. Veterans Day is also known as Armistice Day, a day where we formally ended major hostilities in World War I on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Veterans Day is not only celebrated by America, but worldwide by allied countries, honoring our service members for their defense of this great nation and to provide freedom and peace everywhere, ending a world war. So when you see a veteran, may he or she be in uniform, or an elderly service person wearing a service hat and pins, please thank them for their service and the sacrifices they have provided for this country. We like this flame of remembrance to not only honor our fallen, but to those of us who took on the responsibility to defend this country from evil and tyranny. For without our veterans, we would not be the great nation we are today. Thank you, and God bless America. And before we close, I first of all would like to thank the Cincinnati Sympathy Orchestra Brass Trio for their lovely renditions. Um, Elizabeth Frymuth on the French horn, Christian Giancino on the trom trombone, and Douglas Lindsay on the trumpet. I also want to thank all the, those who came to dedicate the wreaths for us. And now we will have Douglas Lindsay on the trumpet. He's going to be playing taps for us. Thank you. And this brings us to the end of our 60th Veterans Day observation to a close. Um, we have the table at the back for the coins, for the um, list of veterans, also for the Red Cross will be willing to help you send greetings to our armed forces. Um, thank you all very much and have a good day. Thank you.